Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today I'm going to discuss my experiences uh, with AMD's Ryzen Threadripper 1950X and the supporting X399 platform. You guys often ask about my PC in the monthly Q&A and seem very interested in what I choose to use as my daily driver. And since I did transition over to Ryzen, the Threadripper 1950X, as I just mentioned, uh, well, almost a year ago now, and we have second generation Threadripper just around the corner, I thought, what better time than to discuss my experiences so far. Prior to the switch over to AMD, a switch I hadn't done for a very long time, I've been using Intel for the longest time, and yeah, I was using the Core i7-6950X, Intel's 2016 flagship high-end desktop CPU, packing 10 cores, uh, 20 threads, and a base frequency of just three gigahertz. It wasn't a particularly good overclocker, but still, the 14 nanometer Broadwell E part came in at an MSRP of $1,700 US. Uh, a somewhat absurd price, but as, well, I suppose it was the best of the best and Intel was able to get away with charging an arm and a leg for it. Just to be clear though, I'm not saying there's no desktop CPUs that aren't worthy of commanding uh, such an asking price. The problem with the 6950X was that it cost 70% more than the 6900K, but only offered 25% more uh, cores. So uh, two extra cores were tacked on and they bumped the price up by 70%. So that's why I say the $1,700 US MSRP was absurd. Still for video editing and encoding, the 6950X was a beast, so I hung onto it for quite some time. In fact, a little over a year later, the Core i7-7900X landed, uh, and that came in at a slightly more reasonable $1,000 US. And although it clocked better than the 6950X, it did use the slower mesh interconnect, and that meant that it wasn't really an upgrade over the 6950X. Also, I knew at the time that it was just a few short months before AMD would release a 16-core, 32-thread Threadripper CPU in August, and then a month after that, uh, Intel would release their 18-core, 36-thread Core i9-7980XE. So after testing the 1950X in August, I waited a month, gave the 7980XE a thorough test, and decided that if I were to invest my own money in either of these products, it would be without a doubt the Threadripper 1950X. So that's what I did. I got my hands on a retail Threadripper 1950X, MSI's X399 Gaming Pro Carbon AC, pretty sweet gaming motherboard that one, and 64 gigabytes of G-Skill Trident Z DDR4 3200 memory, and threw it all together. At the time, the 1950X cost half as much as the Core i9-7980XE, and in many workloads was only a fraction slower. That being the case, in terms of value, the 1950X was the clear winner. In the benchmarks, its price to performance absolutely destroyed the Skylake X range, making a complete and utter mockery of the Core i9-7980XE, and then its 16, 14, 12, and 10 core variants. That said, the Threadripper platform did have some issues, uh, most new platforms tend to, so uh, nothing totally unexpected there, and we do see the same from Intel uh, quite regularly, actually. So anyway, let's talk about those teething problems. As with all first-gen Ryzen products, Threadripper's biggest issue was memory compatibility, and it was an even bigger issue on the TR4 socket than it was on the mainstream AM4 socket. The reason I say this is because uh, most building a high-end desktop system designed for, well, I suppose workstation type usage, uh, those kind of people will likely populate all the DIMM slots with as much memory as they possibly can. And Ryzen doesn't particularly like that. Assuming you have compatible memory, it will of course work. It just won't work at the same frequency uh, populating half the DIMMs would. As an example, my MSI X399 motherboard packed eight DIMM slots and I decided to populate all of them with eight gigabyte DDR4 3200 modules. And that gave me a total system capacity of 64 gigabytes. And yeah, before you ask, uh, I did need that much memory and quite a few times Premiere when working on our 4K 60fps high bitrate content uh, did use quite a lot of the memory, almost all of it in fact. The problem was with all eight modules installed, the system was limited to a maximum speed of DDR4-2666 and even then at times I did run into a few cold boot issues. Uh, most of the time the system did boot up okay but yeah, in the early days it was a bit frustrating at times. MSI did continue to release BIOS updates and Along the way, that seemed to get ironed out and the problem went away. So yeah, at least one teething issue there was solved. 
That said, to this day, I am stuck at DDR4 2666 if I want to run with all 64 gigabytes of memory. And well, that might not sound like a big deal to many of you, but the system is noticeably better with DDR4 3200. So that being the case, around three months ago now, I just bit the bullet. I decided to strip out 32 gigabytes of memory. Uh, again, that also sounds quite crazy. Uh, but the faster memory speed really did improve the editing performance in Premiere. Uh, the application was just noticeably more responsive. And of course, gaming was also a lot better as well. So that is certainly quite the compromise, but I felt it was worth making. Encoding still takes around the same amount of time for any of you wondering. Uh, the difference with half as much memory, the 32 gigabytes is, things are just a bit laggier when Premiere is doing its thing encoding something. So if I'm using Chrome or whatever, it's just not as silky smooth as it was with 64 gigabytes. Of course, from time to time, I also game on my main rig. I do have a separate gaming system, but I don't know, sometimes I'm just too lazy to get up and move my body to it. I don't know, long, long days of work. You just want to fire up a game that's quick and easy and have a few rounds. And that's what I often find myself doing. And for the first uh, six months, let's say, it was a little bit sketchy. Some titles just didn't work that well. I decided to leave the memory mode as UMA. So that's uniform memory access mode as this works better for productivity workloads. So that makes sense on my editing rig. It is possible to switch over to a non-uniform memory access mode or NUMA for short, uh, but you do have to reset the whole system to do that. Still, as this was mostly a workstation PC, I didn't want to be messing around with memory access modes, having to reset the PC every time I decided to casually fire up a game for a couple of rounds. The good news is at some point, unfortunately, I don't know exactly when so that's not terribly helpful but I suppose it doesn't really matter because now it is a lot better but at some point uh, gaming performance just got a whole lot less sketchy so games would just load up and work as you would expect them to. So I'm not sure if it was one of the major Windows updates or just a BIOS update from MSI. I'm not sure what it was, but I stopped seeing a lot of the glitches and issues I was seeing in, well, some of the games I play. A good example would be Star Wars Battlefront 2. That one was quite painful. Uh, the game itself, once I got into the game, played fine, but just loading the game up, so executing it from the desktop to load the menu, that took quite a few minutes, whereas on the 8700K system it was, I don't know, 30 seconds or something, whereas it was three or four minutes, something crazy like that. So don't know if many people encountered that. Maybe it was just my rig, but that was one of the bugs I ran into. And at some point without me doing anything, no fresh install, nothing, those issues went away. And I was experiencing it in a couple of games, but Star Wars was definitely the worst one. Still, as I've said, not all games had issues straight away. A lot of them played fine. Uh, Battlefield 1, for example, that ran without any problems at all, ran really smooth and all that sort of stuff, as you'd expect on like a Ryzen 7 processor. Uh, today, though, I'm no longer seeing any issues at all when playing games on the 1950X, whether it's a really basic game like Fortnite or something yeah, more in-depth like Battlefield 1 or Star Wars Battlefront 2. They all play perfectly fine, so that's something... Beyond the memory woes and the early teething problems, uh, with some of the games anyway, uh, it's been smooth sailing. As I just said, no issues with games anymore. They all play silky smooth, so no dramas there. And I just have to make the compromise between a memory capacity or high-speed memory. You can't have both. So that's a bit disappointing, but yeah, it's the first-generation Ryzen thing. Well, even the second-generation Ryzen CPU still suffer that. Uh, it's not quite as bad, though. As a side note, though, I should also add that it's not like Intel's X29 platform uh, hasn't had its fair share of teething issues either, uh, just as the X99 platform before it did. So none of this is particularly unusual or an AMD-only problem, let's say. For everything else, though, Threadripper has really delivered delivered in a big way. Having 16 cores and 32 threads to play with is, uh, it's just amazing and really something that we could have only dreamt of uh, prior to its release. As I said earlier, in 2016, 10 cores was the pinnacle for desktop CPUs anyway, and it cost you a sweet $1,700 US. And then in 2017, uh, in the face of competition, Intel released a pretty underwhelming 10 core CPU for $1,000 US. So, whoopee. <laughs> By the end of 2017 though, AMD was selling the 1950X for less than $1,000 US and today it can be found on Amazon for $775 US while the 7900X still costs $1,000 US. So AMD is undercutting Intel quite heavily there. Anyway, I've spent almost one year with Threadripper and I don't regret the decision to go over to it from the, well I suppose I would have gone to the Core i9-7980XE. Uh, if I didn't jump over to Threadripper. So yeah, I don't regret that one bit. The 7980XE is plenty powerful, but 
it just doesn't make sense in terms of price versus performance. And I like to use the kind of hardware that I would recommend you guys use and the stuff that I imagine most of you would use. I don't think too many people would spend twice as much money on the 7980XE. And on that note, if Intel don't come out with something a far more compelling than what they're currently offering, I can't see myself jumping back to the blue team anytime soon. In fact, I'm almost certain I will be doubling down and upgrading to the Threadripper 2990WX on MSI's X399 Creation motherboard. I can't wait to do that build on the channel. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Now just jumping back to the previous generation for a second and just sort of summarizing what I just said, uh, had Intel been far more aggressive with pricing, it may have been a tough call this one, but for half the price, the 1950X really was the obvious choice over the 7980XE. And today it should be crystal clear even for the most blue-eyed fans. What also should be clear at this point is that next week things are going to get seriously messy for Intel as AMD pushes out their second generation Threadripper series. Uh, we learnt at Computex that AMD would be releasing a 32-core 64-thread Threadripper CPU on the TR4 socket, and we just learnt that it's going to cost less than Intel's 18-core 7980XE, coming in at an MSRP of $1,800 US. So assuming everything goes smoothly with this release, and we can probably expect it to really given how well second generation Ryzen was received, it's very likely my workstation is going to see a doubling of cores in the very near future. And fingers crossed, improved memory support. And that is going to do it for this one. If you did enjoy the video, feel free to hit the like button for us, please. Uh, subscribe for more content. If you appreciate the work we do at Hard Unbox, then consider supporting us on Patreon. Thanks for watching. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.